Hey guys, welcome back. TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to part two of our next vice presidential series installment, taking a look at the 11th vice president of the United States, George Mifflin Dallas. Hope you enjoyed part one yesterday. Of course, part one, we took a look at the early life and the early political life and the rise in politics and that sort of thing of George Mifflin Dallas. And now in part two, we're going to be taking a look at the vice presidency, kind of his legacy, and then, of course, his death and his gravesite there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So we're going to jump right in here. And as we like to do in part twos and in every series we do, we like to take a look at the election that ended up electing that president or vice president or whoever or whomever it may be. So we're going to take a look at the uh, election of 1844. The election of 1844 was uh, James K. Polk, the Democrat. Uh, he was going up against Henry Clay of the Whig Party. Uh, James K. Polk's running mate was George Mifflin Dallas. Uh, and then the running mate of Henry Clay was Theodore Freilinghusen. Freilinghusen? Freilinghusen? Um, so, of course, James K. Polk won. Uh, and it was quite interesting. Uh, just taking a look here at these maps and such uh, that you're looking at. It was not really a very, very close. I mean, it was somewhat close. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a landslide by any means, but... Polk did win with 170 electoral votes to Clay's 105 electoral votes. Uh, so, you know, Polk did win, uh, you know, fairly convincingly. Uh, definitely not a landslide by any sort. So um, that's what you're seeing, some campaign posters, that sort of thing, and maps. Now we're going to get into actual, like, the, the soup and nuts, the whole kit and caboodle, the meat and potatoes of... The 1844 campaign and the election. Here we go. So the 1844 campaign and election favoring Van Buren for the 1844 Democratic presidential nomination, George Mifflin Dallas worked successfully to blunt Buchanan's drive for that prize. Van Buren sought unsuccessfully to have the Democratic convention held in November of 1843 rather than late May of 1844. He had hoped to capture the nomination before his opposition to the annexation of Texas became public when Congress convened in early December. By April of 1844, with Democratic support for annexation intensifying, Van Buren watched helplessly as his chances for regaining the White House slipped away. Under the influence of Van Buren's opponents, the Democratic Party's Baltimore Convention in May adopted the Jackson-era rule that required a two-thirds vote to select its nominee. After eight deadlocked ballots at the superheated and violence-prone convention, supporters of Van Buren and his chief rival, Michigan's Lewis Cass, united on the unheralded former House Speaker James K. Polk of Tennessee, who thus became the first successful dark horse candidate in American presidential history. To cement an alliance with the disgruntled Van Buren faction, Polk offered to support a Van Buren loyalist for the vice presidential nomination, New York Senator Silas Wright. Although Wright was absent from the convention, those delegates who had not already left town willingly added him to the ticket. Four days earlier, Professor Samuel F.B. Morse had successfully demonstrated that his newly invented magnetic electric telegraph could transmit messages over the 40-mile distance between the U.S. Capitol and Baltimore. Silas Wright was in the Capitol Rotunda reading other telegraphic reports from the Baltimore Convention when news of his nomination arrived. Bitter at the convention's rejection of Van Buren, Wright dictated a response to Morse, who typed out the following message to the convention's waiting delegates. Washington, important. Mr. Wright is here and says, 
say to the New York delegation that he cannot accept the nomination. His party's remaining delegates in Baltimore did not fully trust this new invention and repeated their message. Morse replied, again, Mr. Wright is here and will support Mr. Polk cheerfully, but cannot accept the nomination for vice president. The unbelieving con convention continued its request until Wright dispatched two members of Congress in a wagon. The evening train to Baltimore had already departed, bearing handwritten letters of rejection. With Wright out of the picture, and with no New York ally of Van Buren willing to accept the nomination, the convention turned to James Buchanan, but he immediately instructed his allies to withdraw his name. The searchlight then swept across several candidates from New England and came to rest on Maine Senator John Fairfield, who received an impressive but inconclusive 106 votes on the first ballot. At the suggestion of party leader and Mississippi Senator Robert J. Walker, who was married to Dallas's niece, Pennsylvania delegates then sparked a move for Dallas, who was at home in Philadelphia. Dallas's views were generally compatible with Polk's, especially on the key issue of annexing Texas. His stand in favor of protective tariffs would appeal to Northeastern commercial interests and offset Polk's ambiguous position on this sensitive issue. Party strategists realized that Pennsylvania, with its prize of nearly 10% of the total electoral votes, which were by no means safely in the Democratic camp, could prove decisive in the election. On the second ballot, the convention gave Dallas the nomination with 220 votes to just 30 for Fairfield. On May 30th, 60 high-spirited delegates left Baltimore for Philadelphia, arriving at the Dallas residence at 3 a.m. As a bewildered Dallas stood by his open door, the nocturnal visitors marched by double columns silently into his parlor. Forming a semicircle, the men burst into applause as Senator Fairfield conveyed the surprising news and Dallas, uneasy at the prospect of returning to public life, accepted with less than abundant enthusiasm. The selection also came as news to presidential nominee Polk, whose advisors quickly assured him that Dallas would be an excellent, excellent complement to the ticket. Within Pennsylvania, opinion was sharply divided as resentful Buchanan allies feared that the less than dynamic Dallas would cost their party the presidency in a contest against the aggressive and better-known Whig candidates. Kentucky's Henry Clay and New Jersey's Theodore Freilandhusen, one Pennsylvania Whig dismissively described Dallas as a gentleman by birth and education, amiable in private life, very bland and courteous in manner, but a reckless partisan totally devoid of principle and capable of upholding or relinquishing opinions whenever his own or his party's interests require it. As was customary prior to 1845, the various states scheduled the presidential election on different days during November's first two weeks. When the votes were finally tallied, the Polk Dallas ticket won 15 out of the 26 states by a comfortable margin of 170 to 105 electoral votes. They were far less convincing, however, in the popular vote, with a margin of only 6,000 out of the 2.7 million ballots cast. Polk narrowly lost his native Tennessee, while Dallas barely carried Pennsylvania. While analysts agreed that victories in New York and Pennsylvania made the difference for the Democratic ticket, no such consensus existed about Dallas's impact on this result. Like many of his contemporaries on the national political stage in 1845, George Mifflin Dallas wanted to be president. In accepting the Democratic nomination, Polk committed himself to serving only one term, hoping this promise would encourage his party's warring factions to suspend their combat at least until the 1848 campaign. 
Instead, his pledge instantly prompted maneuvering from many quarters for the 1848 nomination. Four of the nation's ten previous vice presidents had moved up to the presidency, and Dallas saw no reason why he should not become the fifth. For his first two years in the second office, Dallas framed his behavior with that goal in mind. Dallas met Polk for the first time on February 13th of 1845, joining the president-elect for the final leg of his railroad journey to Washington. Dallas used the opportunity to follow up on his earlier suggestions for cabinet nominees he believed would strengthen the party and his own presidential chances. He particularly sought to sabotage sabotage arch-rival James Buchanan's hopes of becoming Secretary of State, the other traditional launching pad to the White House. Buchanan had arrogantly instructed Pennsylvania's presidential electors to recommend him for that post at the time they cast their ballots for the Democratic ticket. This infuriated Dallas, who promised a friend that, while he had become vice president willy-nilly and expected to endure heavy and painful and protracted sacrifices, I am resolved that no one shall be taken from Pennsylvania in a cabinet office who is notoriously hostile to the vice president. If such a choice be made, my relations with the administration are at once at an end. Several weeks later, learning that Polk had indeed chosen Buchanan, Dallas failed to follow up on his dark oath. Instead, he began quietly to lobby for the appointment of Senator Robert J. Walker, his earlier choice against Buchanan for the State Department, for the influential post of Treasury Secretary. Polk, realizing that he had offended Dallas and Walker's Southern Democratic allies, awarded the Treasury post to Walker. Dallas continued to be sensitive about the administration's distribution of major appointments as he sought to strengthen his Pennsylvania political base in order to weaken the Buchanan faction and enhance his own presidential prospects. In his subsequent appointments, however, Polk continued to antagonize Dallas as well as others in the Democratic Party. Again, the president tried to appease the vice president. I would have been pleased to explain to you some of the circumstances attending the appointments at Philadelphia, which were made some time ago, but no opportunity for that purpose has occurred. Dallas responded that it was pointless to discuss these matters in as much as you have not been able to gratify the few requests I have previously made. Despite his frustration and subsequent patronage losses to Secretary of State Buchanan, who was a far tougher and more persistent operator, the vice president endeavored to remain loyal to his president and party. From 1789 to 1845, the Senate followed the practice of selecting its committees by ballot, with the exception of several years in the 1820s and 1830s when the power was specifically given to the presiding officer from 1823 to 1826, or, more pointedly, to the President pro tempore, 1828 to 1833, an officer selected by and responsible to the Senate. When the Senate convened in March of 1845 for its brief special session to receive the new President's executive nominations, Democratic Party leaders engineered a resolution that revived the practice of having the Vice President appoint the members of standing committees. Acknowledging that the vice president was not directly responsible to the Senate, administration allies asserted that his, that his was a greater responsibility as guaranteed in the Constitution to the Senate's masters, the people of these United States. The goal was to pack the Committee on Foreign Relations with members sympathetic to the administration's position On the Oregon boundary question, Vice President Dallas made the desired appointments. In December of 1845, at the opening of the Senate's regular legislative session, 
Party leaders again sought to give the appointment power to Dallas. On this occasion, however, four rebellious Democrats joined minority party Whigs to defeat the resolution by a one-vote margin. This action presented the Polk administration with the unappealing likelihood that in balloting by the full Senate, Democrats hostile to its specific objectives would take control of key Senate committees. Dallas reported that the return to the usual procedure required him to work unusually hard to superintend some 16 or 20 ballotings for officers and chairmen of committees. He was much encouraged by the kind manner in which I am complimented on my mode of presiding. But I assure you, he continued, contrary to my expectations, it is not done without a great deal of preparatory labor. Now that the anti-administration hostility has shown itself, I am bound to be ready at all points and against surprises. To end this time-consuming process, Senate party leaders took a step of major importance for the future development of legislative political parties. The Democrats and Whigs each organized a party caucus to prepare lists of committee assignments, an arrangement that marked the beginning of the Senate seniority system. As long as committee members had been selected by secret ballot or appointed by presiding officers, a member's experience did not guarantee his selection. After 1845, seniority became a major de uh, determinant, particularly in the selection of committee chairmen. Legislative parties charged with preparing slates of committee assignments tended to become more cohesive. In this period, the tradition also began of seating in the chamber by party, with the Democrats to the presiding officer's right and the Whigs, later the Republicans, to the left. From his canopy dais, the vice president had the best seat in the nation's best theater. On one memorable occasion, he reported to his wife that, the speech of Senator Daniel Webster today would have over overwhelmed and perhaps disgusted you. He attacked Pennsylvania's representative, Mr. C.J. Ingersoll, with the savage and mangling ferocity of a tiger. For at least a half an hour, he grit his teeth, scowled, stamped, and roared forth the very worst and most abusive language I have ever heard uttered in the Senate. Dallas later observed that vast intellect, like Webster's, almost naturally glides into arrogance. In his brief inaugural address to the Senate, Dallas had acknowledged that he entered into his tranquil and unimposing new duties without any of the cares of real power and none of the responsibilities of legislation, except in rare instances when he might be called on to break tied votes. If anything, he would stand as an organ of freedom's fundamental principle of order. Despite this noble disclaimer of partisanship, Dallas involved himself deeply in the struggle to help the president achieve his legislative agenda. He worked against strong contrary pressures from the party's Western faction, led by Senator Thomas Hart Benton and its Southern Bloc under the inspiration of Senator John C. Calhoun. In assessing these senators' motives, Dallas reported that Benton intended to oppose Calhoun wherever possible. If Mr. Calhoun should support the Polk administration, Colonel Benton will not be able to resist the impulse to oppose it. On the contrary, if Mr. Calhoun opposes, Colonel Benton will be our champion. Such are, in the highest spheres of action, the uncertainties and extravagancies of human passions. At the start of his term as Senate President, George Mifflin Dallas was called on to make an administrative decision that had larger constitutional consequences. Since 1815, senators had received a compensation of $8 for each day they were present in Washington. Public opposition routinely frustrated persistent congressional efforts to move instead to an annual salary. In March of 1845, 
several senators hit upon a novel way to supplement their compensation to collect travel expenses to and from Washington for the special session that the Senate held at the start of each new administration to confirm presidential appointments. The problem was that senators had already been paid for their travel to the final regular session of the Congress that adjourned the day before the special session began. When veteran Secretary of the Senate Asbury Dickens informed Dallas that no distinct and controlling decision had ever been made on this issue, Dallas ruled in a lengthy written opinion that each senator should be paid for travel at the beginning and end of each session without an inquiry or regard as to where he actually was or how he was actually engaged, and without any inquiry or regard as to where he intends to travel or remain when the Senate adjourns. This decision unleashed a flood of applications from current and former senators for compensation for travel to earlier special sessions, until Dallas advised that the ruling would not be applied retroactively. Several years later, in response to a Treasury Department challenge of the Dallas ruling, the Attorney General concluded that the President of the Senate is the sole judge of the amounts of compensation due and his certificate is conclusive, and that mileage is part of a Senator's compensation and not mere defrayment of traveling expenses, and hence actual travel is not necessary. Dallas followed the custom of members of Congress who rented rooms for the duration of a congressional session, either on Capitol Hill or closer to the White House. During the regular session of the 29th Congress from December of 1845 through August of 1846, Dallas resided at Henry Riles' boarding house within a short walk of the Capitol at 3rd Street and Maryland Avenue Northeast. For the first session of the 30th Congress from December of 1847 to August of 1848, Dallas lived at Mrs. Gatsby's on President Square across from the White House. For his final session from December 1848 to March of 1849, he moved several blocks to Mr. Levi Williams' boarding house on the north side of Pennsylvania Avenue between 17th and 18th Streets Northwest. At the beginning of his first regular session in December of 1845, Dallas set a daily routine in which he arrived at the vice president's office in the Capitol at 9 a.m. He remained busily engaged there receiving visitors and presiding until 4 p.m., adjourned to his lodgings for lunch, and then returned to the Capitol until 9 or 10 p.m. For a diversion, he would stroll around the Capitol grounds or walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. The newly refurbished Senate chamber, he pronounced, redeemed from a thousand barbarisms, but he confided to his son that he expected the coming session to be one of the most important, disturbed, and protracted in the nation's history and feared that the weakness of administration supporters in the Senate may exact more exertion from me than would otherwise fall my share." Dallas regularly complained about the inconveniences and demands of his daily life as vice president. His wife disliked Washington and remained in Philadelphia except for rare visits. He dined frequently with Treasury Secretary Robert Walker and his nephew, U.S. Coast Survey Superintendent Alexander Dallas Bach, a great-grandson of Benjamin Franklin. His biographer reports that during these years, the vice president allowed himself one luxury, a stylish African-American coachman who wore a distinctive black hat with broadband and steel buckle. Dallas was ill a great deal and complained of digestive disorders and sore feet, which he routinely bathed in hot water augmented with mustard or cayenne pepper. Always concerned about earning enough money to support his di desired social position and his wife's easy spending habits, Dallas supplemented his $5,000 government salary by maintaining an active law practice during his vice presidency. He handled several high-profile cases against the federal government, including a claim against the Treasury Department for $15 million. 
the decision would be made by his close friend and relative by marriage, Treasury Secretary Robert Walker. Dallas, whose co-counsel in the case was Senator Daniel Webster, considered that unless Walker has lost his intelligence and fairness, the case will be a lucrative one. To Dallas's dismay and veiled anger, Walker decided against his client. At the midpoint in his vice presidency, George Mifflin Dallas accepted a $1,000 fee for a secondary role in representing wealthy Philadelphia Pierce Philadelphian Pierce Butler in his celebrated divorce from the Shakespearean actress Fanny Kemble. Fearing that the nation's top legal talent would be attracted to Kemble's side, Butler preemptively purchased much of that talent, including Dallas and Daniel Webster. Despite intense criticism by political opponents for cashing in on his national prominence, the vice president tossed off these attacks as the hissling and gobbling of snakes and geese and spent his final months in office arranging an expanded legal partnership with his son, Philip. So now just a little bit about tariffs and the westward expansion and such. George Mifflin Dallas determined that he would use his vice presidential position to advance two of the administration's major objectives, tariff reduction and territorial expansion. As a Pennsylvanian, Dallas had traditionally supported the protectionist tariff policy that his state's coal and iron interests demanded. But as vice president elected on a platform dedicated to tariff reduction, he agreed to do anything necessary to realize that goal. Dallas equated the vice president's constitutional power to break tied votes in the Senate with the president's constitutional power to veto acts of Congress. At the end of his vice presidential term, Dallas claimed that he cast 30 tie-breaking votes during his four years in office, although only 19 of these have been identified in Senate records. Taking obvious personal satisfaction in this record, Dallas singled out this achievement and the fairness with which he believed he accomplished it in his farewell address to the Senate. Not interested in political suicide, however, Dallas sought to avoid having to exercise his singular constitutional prerogative on the tariff issue, actively lobbying senators during the debate over Treasury Secretary Walker's tariff bill in the summer of 1846. He complained to his wife, whom he sometimes addressed as Mrs. Vice, that the Senate speeches on the subject were as vapid as inexhaustible. All sorts of ridiculous efforts are making by letters, newspapers, paragraphs, and personal visits to affect the Vice's casting vote by persuasion or threat. Despite Dallas's efforts to avoid taking a stand, the Senate completed its voting on the Walker tariff with a 27 to 27 tie. A 28th vote in favor was held in reserve by a senator who opposed the measure but agreed to follow the instructions of his state legislature to support it. When he cast the tie-breaking vote in favor of the tariff on July 28th of 1846, Dallas rationalized that he had studied the distribution of Senate support and concluded that backing for the measure came from all regions of the country. Additionally, the measure had overwhelmingly passed the House of Representatives, a body closer to public sentiment. He apprehensively explained to the citizens of Pennsylvania that an officer elected by the suffrages of all 28 states and bound by his oath and every constitutional obligation, faithfully and fairly to represent in the execution of his high trust, all the citizens of the Union could not narrow his great sphere and act with reference only to Pennsylvania's interests. While his action, based on a mixture of party loyalty and political opportunism, earned Dallas the respect of the president and certain party leaders, and possible votes in 1848 from the southern and western states that supported low tariffs, it effectively demolished his home state's political base, ending any serious prospects for future elective office. 
He even advised his wife in a message hand-delivered by the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms if there be the slightest indication of a disposition to riot in the city of Philadelphia owing to the passage of the tariff bill, pack up and bring the whole brood to Washington. While Dallas's tariff vote destroyed him in Pennsylvania, his aggressive views on Oregon and the Mexican War crippled his campaign efforts elsewhere in the nation. In his last hope of building the necessary national support to gain the White House, the vice president shifted his attention to the aggressive, expansionist foreign policy program embodied in the concept of Manifest Destiny. He actively supported efforts to gain control of Texas, the Southwest, Cuba, and disputed portions of the Oregon Territory. The joint United States-British occupation of the vast Western Territory in the region, north of the 42nd parallel and south of the boundary at 54 degrees, 40 minutes, was scheduled for renewal in 1847. Dallas seized the opportunity in 1846 to call for a settlement at the 54 degrees, 40 minute line, even at the risk of war with Great Britain. For several months early in 1846, the vice president pursued this position, seeking to broaden his national political base until President Polk and British leaders agreed to compromise on a northern boundary at the 49th parallel. This outcome satisfied Dallas as it removed his earlier fear that the United States would be caught in a two-front war with Great Britain over the Oregon boundary and with Mexico over control of Texas. Now the nation would be free to concentrate on war with Mexico, a conflict that Dallas hoped would serve to unify the Democratic Party and propel him to the White House. As the Mexican War continued into 1847, Dallas expanded his own objective to taking all of Mexico. Again, a moderate course advanced by more realistic leaders prevailed and forced Dallas to applaud publicly the result that gained for the United States the Mexican states of California and New Mexico. The events of 1846 extinguished Dallas's presidential fire. Although he remained strong in Philadelphia and its immediate precincts, Buchanan sapped his strength throughout the rest of their state. The vice president, incapable of the intense and sustained personal drive necessary to secure the nomination, nonetheless sought to bolster his political standing by advocating popular sovereignty as a solution to the crippling issue of allowing slavery in the ter territories. This stance only hardened the opposition against him, and he soon abandoned his presidential quest. Democratic Party leaders originally looked to Mexican war hero Zachary Taylor as their 1848 standard bearer. When the general cast his lot with the Whigs, Democrats turned to Michigan's Lewis Cass, who took the nomination at the Baltimore Convention on the fourth ballot. They chose General William O. Butler as the vice presidential candidate, with Martin Van Buren's third-party candidacy eroding the Democratic vote, Taylor and his running mate, Millard Fillmore, easily won the election. By the end of the Mexican War in 1848, relations between Polk and Dallas had deteriorated to the point that the two men rarely spoke to one another. From the first days of his vice presidency, Dallas complained to his wife Sophia and others that the president cared little for his advice on either small matters or major affairs of state. At the outbreak of the war with Mexico, Dallas confided in making the officers of the new regiment of mounted riflemen, the tenant of the White House has maintained, maintained his consistency of action by excluding everyone for whom I felt an interest. When Polk summoned the vice president to the White House for a most important communication, Dallas told Sophia that Polk had a habit of making mountains out of molehills and that the meeting was another illustration of the mountain and the mouse. 
I am heartily sick of fictitious importance. Factitious importance. Dallas considered Polk to be cold, devious, and two-faced. When he received Thomas Macaulay's newly published History of England, he noted that the author's description of Charles I's defects of character, faithlessness, and cunning are so directly applicable to President Polk as almost to be curious. Dallas entered the sunset of his vice presidency at the three-month final session of the 30th Congress, beginning on December 4th of 1848. On the following day at noon, the Senate convened for the reading by its clerk of President Polk's State of the Union message. Dallas listened for a while until boredom compelled him to turn the chair over to Senator William King. It was insufferably long, and some of its topics, a dissertation on the American system and one on the veto power especially, were almost ludicrous from their being misplaced and prolix. This lame duck session, with its contentiousness and inaction, proved particularly frustrating as the Democrats sought to defer action on the volatile issues. The great party project of the session is to try hard to do nothing, leaving all unsettled questions, and especially the free soil one, to harass General Taylor next winter. Dallas was constantly aware of his responsibilities for maintaining order on the Senate floor. During the contentious final session, Mississippi's Henry Foote constantly baited Missouri's Thomas Hart Benton. While Benton never hesitated to bully other adversaries, he inexplicably refrained from challenging the diminutive Mississippian. As the Senate adjourned for the day on February 10th of 1849, Benton approached Dallas and in a whisper asked whether he intended to act on his earlier request that alcoholic beverages be banned in the Senate. Dallas responded by asking whether any drinking had been taking place in the chamber. Yes, in quantities, in every part and at all times, responded the agitated Missourian. Dallas, believing that Benton's concern stemmed from an effort to curb Foote's behavior and to excuse his own silent disregard of it in that way, instructed the sergeant-at-arms to ban liquor on the Senate side of the Capitol except for members claiming to require it for medicinal purposes. Dallas told his wife that he was tempted to return home, leaving his Senate duties to a president pro tempore, but he felt obligated to remain at the Capitol for the important business of receiving the presidential electoral ballots addressed to his attention that were then arriving from the individual states. He explained that his duty was to mark on each envelope containing a state's ballots, the day and manner of receiving it, and file them with the Secretary of the Senate, of course, without breaking the seals. If a messenger hand me the list, I gave him a certificate to that effect, on which he is entitled to be paid his expenses at the Treasury Department. The President expressed to the Vice President his ambivalence about his plans for the forthcoming inauguration of Zachary Taylor. If the planners reversed a place for him, he would attend. Otherwise, he would follow Van Buren's 1841 precedent and simply go home. Dallas said he would try to follow the proper courtesies of public life unless he too was intentionally slighted. He examined the practice of his predecessors and found that Richard Mentor Johnson to be the only vice president to have attended the swearing-in of his successor. On March 2nd of 1849, Dallas followed the vice presidential custom of delivering a farewell address to the Senate and then stepping aside so that the Senate could elect a president pro temper to bridge the transition between administrations. In remarks more exalted in phrasing than the observations of his personal diary and correspondence, Dallas praised the Senate for the elevated principle and dignified tone which mark its proceedings, the frank and yet forbearing temper of its discussions, the mutual manifestations 
of conciliatory deference so just and appropriate among the delegates of independent states and the consequent calmness and precision of its legislative action, which he believed had attracted to it a very large share of veneration and confidence. He noted that on occasion tempers flared into sudden sudden impulses of feeling, but these transient disturbances were rare and passed over the scene like flashes which do but startle and then cease, serving only to exhibit in stronger relief the grave decorum of its general conduct. To a standing ovation, Dallas left the chamber in what, in what he believed would be the last scene of my public life. He recorded in his diary that Mr. Fillmore called at my chamber in the Capitol today. Shortly I had, uh, shortly I had left the Senate and remained for an hour, making inquiries as to the forms of proceedings and the general duties annexed to the office he was about assuming. He was good enough to say that everybody had told him I eclipsed, as a presiding officer, all of my predecessors, and that he felt extreme diffidence in undertaking to follow me. Of course, after this, I took pleasure in answering all his questions." Dallas left Washington largely embittered about the price of success in public life, which he believed led almost invariably to poverty and ignorance. Truth, courage, candor, wisdom, firmness, honor, and religion may by accident now and then be serviceable, but a steady perseverance in them leads inevitably to private life. His only regret about leaving the Senate was that he would miss the strange political tableau that would present itself on the floor of the Senate chamber. On the 6th of March, next, if Mr. Clay, General Cass, Mr. Van Buren, Mr. Calhoun, Mr. Webster, and Colonel Benton were grouped together. Such a convocation of self-imagined gods could not fail to be followed by much thunder and lightning. But he consoled himself. All this galaxy in the order of nature may disappear in the course or two of th or three years. When then? Why the sun will still shine, the earth still roll upon its axis, and the worms of the capital be as numerous and phosphorescent as ever. <clears throat> so there you go. That is kind of his time in... Um as vice president and then it ended of course now later years basically with dallas george mifflin dallas returned to private life until 1856 when james buchanan resigned as minister to great britain to launch his presidential campaign challenging president franklin pierce for the democratic nomination pierce seeking to remove another potential rival for re-election named dallas to that prized diplomatic post Philadelphia journalist John Forney, a longtime Buchanan ally who had once described Dallas as below mediocre as a public man, thought the 64-year-old Dallas fit the part. I do not know anything more charming, always accepting a lovely woman, than a handsome old man, one who, like a winter apple, is ruddy and ripe with time and yet sound to the heart. Such a man was George M. Dallas. After Buchanan won the presidency, he retained Dallas at the court of St. James, but conducted sensitive diplomatic relations with Great Britain from the White House. Tired and longing for the comforts of home and family, Dallas resigned his post in May of 1861. As a state's rights unionist, he was deeply saddened by the eclipse of his Democratic Party, and its failure to prevent civil war. George Mifflin Dallas died at the age of 72 on December 31st of 1864. So there you have it, uh, a little bit more. Uh, Dallas returned to Philadelphia and lived in Philadelphia until his death from a heart attack on December 31st of 1864 at the age of 72. He is interred in St. Peter's Churchyard in Philadelphia. 
So there you have it, George Mifflin Dallas, his legacy, his vice presidency, all of it, all of it wrapped up there. Now just a little bit about his legacy. Dallas County, Iowa, and one of its cities, Dallas Center, Iowa, were named after the vice president. In addition, Dallas County, Arkansas, Dallas County, Missouri, and Dallas County, Texas were also named in his honor. Other U.S. cities and towns named in Dallas's honor include Dallas, Georgia, which is the county seat of Paulding County, Georgia, Dallas, North Carolina, which is the former county seat of Gaston County, North Carolina, Dallas, Oregon, the county seat of Polk County, Oregon, and Dallastown, Pennsylvania. It is debated whether the city of Dallas, Texas, is named after the vice president. So there is some debate over that. Um, but, you know, there is speculation that it was named after George Mifflin Dallas, but we're not exactly sure if it was or not. Um, who knows? So there you have it, guys. Uh, that is kind of the life and legacy of George Mifflin Dallas. Now, he is buried, uh, as I said, at the St. Peter's Episcopal Churchyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm showing you a couple pictures here of his grave site. Uh, just kind of a basic big, huge marble or whatever it's made of slab uh, with all of the names on it. His at the top, his wife Sophia is buried there, and several of his children are buried there. Um, I know his um, his son Alexander is buried over with his grandparents in the same churchyard, but um, like Sophia is buried there, Julia is buried there, Philip is buried there, Catherine, Susan, a bunch of his... Uh, his children are buried there with him and his wife. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, and that's pretty much it, guys. That's the life, the legacy, uh, the vice presidency, the death, the gravesite of our 11th vice president of the United States, George Mifflin Dallas. Uh, stay tuned. There is a little bonus footage of his gravesite, some videos from there, uh, and also some other kind of cool little things. So stay tuned for that. And there, that's it. There you have it. Uh, the 11th Vice President of the United States, George Mifflin Dallas. Now stay tuned because next week will be our next Vice Presidential Series installment. And we're going to be taking a look at... So obviously, the 12th Vice President is actually Millard Fillmore. But we're not going to be looking at him because he became president. So we're going to be taking a look next week at the 13th Vice President who is William Rufus King, which is going to be really interesting. So stay tuned for that. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for all the love and support. Keep it coming. Keep all those comments and questions coming. Can't thank you guys enough. Henry and I really appreciate it. And again, stay tuned for a little bonus footage, and we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye now. Hey guys, TJ with Dead History here. You can see the uh, St. Peter's Episcopal Church behind me. I'm still here in Philadelphia. I want to flip you guys around actually. Just to show you this such a cool old churchyard cemetery. I love these historical churchyard cemeteries. I mean, how amazing. So I'm actually looking for George Mifflin Dallas, our 11th Vice President. His parents are buried here. Um... His parents are buried here, and I'll be honest with you, I really, I'm not 100% sure where. I think that might be them right back there. So I'm going to take you guys with me. But just, I just wanted to show you how cool and old this is, and, you know, just so freaking neat. It's just, I love this stuff. Gives you a map of kind of, you know, who's here. And you see right there, uh, da -da -da. I know, there it is, George Mifflin Dallas. Mayor of Philadelphia and Vice President of the United States for whom Dallas, Texas was presumably named. So there you go. Kind of just shows you St. Peter's Churchyard here in Philly. And yes, it is. Perfect. I was right. So this is actually George Mifflin Dallas's parents. Alexander James Dallas 
and Arabella Maria Dallas. So this is our 11th Vice President of the United States. This is his parents right here. Uh, pretty cool stuff. So there you go. George Mifflin Dallas's parents, his mother and father, buried right here. Very, very, very cool stuff. So there you go, guys. Thanks. Hey guys, TJ here with you. And yep, I'm here in Philadelphia at the St. Peter's Episcopal Churchyard. Right there, that's the gravesite of our 11th Vice President. Let me flip you around. So there you go. Gravesite of George Mifflin Dallas. As you see here, George Mifflin Dallas. Okay, and then his wife Sophia, right there. That's one of his children, Philip. Um, his other daughter, Catherine, she's buried here. I believe, uh, believe there's a few of his children. I think Julia is one of his, uh, daughters, but yes, several of his children, himself and his wife are buried here. George Mifflin Dallas, the 11th vice president of the United States. Um, we're right here in the, in the heart of Philadelphia, of course. Uh, pretty cool stuff. There you go. George Mifflin Dallas. See, it's a very old, old churchyard cemetery. It's very cool. But there you go. That's the gravesite of our 11th Vice President, George Mifflin Dallas, here in Philadelphia. Thanks, guys.